I call to order the October 2023 meeting of the Audit and Compliance Committee of the University of Minnesota Board of Regents. Good morning, everyone. Thank you to those who are joining us via the live stream video and those attending in the boardroom or via Zoom. Um, Regent Kenyanya should be arriving momentarily. Let me welcome our student representatives for today, Alex Mittendorf from the Crookston campus and Nico Vasopoulos from the Twin Cities campus. I'm sure I got that close, hopefully. <laughs> um, let's see, the first item of business this morning is an overview of the process we will use as a committee to review the university's annual financial statements. Here to walk us through that process are Controller Molly Viola and Associate Vice President Michael Volna. Controller Viola, would you like to start us off on this item? I think actually Michael Bonilla will be sharing some remarks first. Great, love that too. Please go ahead. Chair Farnsworth and members of the committee, thanks for having us. Um, so I am gonna turn it over to Molly and let her cover this. Um, this process that we're gonna describe is an annual process that you go through and it relates to um, your responsibility both for uh, an understanding of the financial statements and the management of the external audit contract. So with that, I'll turn it over to Molly and she can walk through what will come now. Good morning, Chair Farnsworth, members of the committee. So this morning is really my opportunity to assist you with some of your obligations related to the issuance of the university's annual statement. I'll be sharing with you an outline of information that will come to the committee um, for review over the next few weeks. If you'd like, um, the related materials are in your docket beginning on page three. I'll start out with some background. Um, we're gonna, what we're gonna walk through is a set of best practices, which were adopted based on some briefings that were done with the Office of General Counsel in relation to the Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002. Now, I wanna clarify that the act does not actually apply to the university, the board, the audit committee, um, but it was at that time that there was the request that uh, some best practices be adopted that align with the spirit of that award, or with that, um, with that act. The best practices that were recommended and adopted by the audit committee include reading the financial statements for items that are inconsistent with your knowledge prior to the issuance to the public. So as a result of those recommendations, the board operations and agenda guidelines were modified to specifically include in the responsibilities section um, what the review requirements actually are. And it states that the audit compliance committee shall review in advance of final issuance, the proposed formats and wordings of the annual financial report, including the management's discussion and analysis, financial statements, footnotes, statistics, and disclosures. So with that in mind, I will walk you through an overview of the timeline and the process. The first step is really today's presentation, which is intended to uh, serve as an advanced summary of the upcoming process. Then on Friday, October 20th, so next week, you'll actually receive a draft of the finalized annual report. This is a significant step in the review process and it's intended to support your oversight responsibilities. It gives you an opportunity to ensure that the items that we present in the university's financial statements are consistent on the actions that you've either taken as the board um, members or just based on information that you've received in that capacity. The annual report is a large document. It's about 90 pages. It has lots of complex information in it. We do encourage you to read any and all of it, um, but we will provide you with a summary of key highlights to kind of help you along with your review. You'll also be provided with contact information so that you can share any questions or comments that you have about the report. Consistent with prior years, there are three sections to the report. The first section is management's discussion and analysis. And really what that section does is allows management to provide a narrative that really connects the financial story of the university statements back with the university uh, mission and priorities. The next section of the financial statements um, will include uh, the consolidated statements of net position. Um, I do want to clarify that these statements include Romenko as well as the University of Minnesota um, Foundation and University of Minnesota Physicians. Um, within the consolidated statements in that position, you'll see assets and liabilities for the university. So this includes things like cash and investments, accounts payable, our debt balances, and things of that nature. Um, this year, you'll, you'll see a new line related to subscription liabilities. These are the result of the implementation of a new uh, governmental accounting standard. GASB 96, and this is related to subscription based information technology arrangements. Um, and also you'll see separate statements for both UMF and UMP for the, um, for the consolidated statements of net position. 
Then you'll also see consolidated statements of revenue, expenses, and changes in net position. And this uh, summarizes the revenue and expenses for the university by category. You'll also see the overall um, uh, net income for the university. And again, you'll see corresponding statements for both University of Minnesota Physicians and University of Minnesota Foundation. You'll also see a consolidated statement of cash flows. Um, the cash flows are broken down into sections that show you the operating cash flow results for the university, as well as uh, capital financing activity, non-capital fi financing activity, and then investing activity. A few years ago, we were also required to add a new set of financial statements for um, that are called the fiduciary financial statements. And these are a snapshot of the activity that the university is involved in in some sort of agency capacity. This typically includes things like the campus club, um, as well as any student financial aid that's actually um, granted directly to students. Then you'll get to the footnotes. Those are typically about 50 to 55 pages. We have 16 footnotes this year, and they are um, additional narrative and uh, table disclosures that are required in our financial statements. They provide additional context related to, uh, to the different types of financial transactions that the university engages in. Um, I've mentioned a notable GASB implementation. I'd like to just kind of clarify that GASB is the governing board that sets the accounting rules that we're required to follow um, in reporting our financial activity. The impact of this year is a liability of approximately $27 million, which really reflects the payments that will occur over the life of certain subscription arrangements. So if it's, if it's a five-year arrangement, it would include the, the future payments related to that. Um, I'd also like to note that this is going to be um, implemented effective for fiscal year 22. So what that means is that we'll actually update the fiscal year, fiscal year 22 results um, as if this GASB had actually been in place last year already. Um, note that when you actually receive the report, it's going to be marked draft. And so the um, Deloitte audit team is still working through their procedures. They will be working through their, their report review as well. Um, and, and there may be changes. Um, however, when we provide it to you as of October 20th, it'll be complete and, and up to date as of that date. If there's anything significant or things that we feel that are notable, we would uh, circle back with you and share what those updates are prior to issuance. Deloitte is targeting to sign off on their audit on Thursday, October 26, to ensure the audit and compliance committee review is complete within the audit deadlines. Uh, please plan on providing any questions that you have either to myself or Chair Farnsworth, and we will discuss those um, when we meet with the committee chair and vice chair. That meeting will be held on the afternoon of October 24th. At that time, we'll talk about any feedback that's been received, if there's any concerns. Um, if we haven't heard any feedback, we'll assume that there is none. And then we'll work with the auditors to finalize and, and issue um, later that week on the 26th. After the report is issued by the auditors, we do provide a copy of it to the state of Minnesota. And then it's also relied upon for several other reports. So things like the single audit, um, the NCAA report, and some other compliance reports as well. Once it's finalized, we do also share a copy of the report um, with the public, and then we'll be back in December to discuss the results in more detail along with Deloitte's required communications in December. And then also at the time, we'll, we'll share a, um, an, an informational item with the Financial Operations Committee as well. So with that, I'll pause and see if there are any questions or comments about the process. Well, thank you very much. Um, that was a very clear update um, of our process to look through these and would look for any questions or comments from committee members. All right, I'll, I'll add one thing, which is um, it was correct in the presentation, but I think it's one day late in the docket for our um, review meeting with the chair and vice chair. It says in the docket Wednesday, October 25th, and uh, you were correct verbally that the meeting is Tuesday, October 24th. So for anyone reading the docket, just wanted to note that. Thank you um, for that clarification, yes. But other than that, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. We appreciate it. Our second item is an update on efforts to improve the coordination and oversight of university safety training in response to an internal audit report finding. Associate Vice President Catherine Bonnison will provide the update, um, and I believe Associate Vice President Bonnison will kick us off on when she's ready. Thank you, Chair Farnsworth. Good morning, committee. Thank you for having me back. <laughs> yes. <laughs> 
So today I'm here to give you an update on safety training here at the university, and this is, again, enterprise-wide. Everything we do in health safety and risk management is system-wide. Um, and then to tie it back to an audit finding that you'll see in some of your reporting and where we are with the status of that, um, with that finding. So I'll jump right in. So currently, um, our department, Health Safety Risk Management, is a primary provider of safety training for the university community. And we provide all types of training. Um, it could go very technical on biological safety in laboratory to avoiding slips, trips, and falls when you're walking into your course in the morning. Um, there's general training on ergonomics, and there's training on wearing personal protective equipment. So about 70 courses that span sort of anything that's safety related. So just to give you an idea of how many people take that training and, and what that looks like, um, and this is about an average number, around 45 to 50,000 courses a year are completed across the university. Again, all five campuses, all rocks, any university property. Um, our team hosts 71 unique courses. Um, they're not all online. Some are in person, some are hybrid, um, depending on what the requirements are. And again, this training is, to, is designed to serve the entire university community and all those requirements um, that are regulatory or you know that follow sort of uh, university policy or just to promote a safer workplace. So how this relates back to an audit finding, we were audited in 2019 by the Office of Internal Audit. Um, and one of the essential findings was around training and not just content and the course listing, but if you notice on those three bullets under the recommendation 2A, um, it was tracking course completion and follow up in a central way. Um, and that one really became sort of the, the, the biggest piece to, to try to take on. And so why it's taken us three to four years, which we'll get into in this presentation, is to do this centrally and to track this centrally, um, there just isn't a mechanism in place. And so we'll talk about that next. But the other pieces of this audit finding we have been tackling over the last three years. And so ensuring there's an accurate and complete, complete course listing, um, and then to make sure that, this, that, that we're constantly updating that course listing and are aware of any regulatory requirements that require changes. So we just, again, why beat around the bush? Why is this finding still in progress? So it was, again, um, the report came out in 2020, it is now 2023. One of the fundamental issues we've been struggling with is that at the university, there's not a centralized employee training system. Um, so this is not to say there's not systems. There are IT solutions. It's really the process of how do we do this across the enterprise where everybody's on one, playing in one sandbox. Um, training Hub is probably the most popular option, but a lot of the schools and colleges will use their own systems, their own, you know, some are homegrown, some are purchased. So with that, there's not a centralized way for us to flag and identify what employees need what training. And then once, if, if we were, if we have an idea of who needs what's training, there isn't a centralized process to track and monitor their completion. And that was sort of the core finding in this audit that we've been trying to tackle. You know, out of 27,000 employees and maybe 10 to 12,000 student employees, and even students who take this, you know, how would we track that across the enterprise? Um, and then there's the bottom piece that we really, as we started to work through this wholeheartedly, just wanted to stop and pause and say, are we meeting all the regulatory requirements? Because there are so many updates and changes that happen on a, you know, to federal, state, local regulations. We just want to make sure we're, we're covering all of those bases. So why we're here today is just to talk about where this finding is and the current status. And I'm gonna spend a little time on the two that are in green on this project scope that say in process. But we, it, it took us a few years to understand what is, the, what is the scope of this project that is doable, that is manageable, because training can mean all sorts of things. There's training that happens in a college and school that might be safety related. Is that in scope? Ooh, I don't know. Or is it really just about the training that we provide in health safety and risk management? We had a lot of conversations with senior leaders, um, with subject matter experts about how do we do this? How do we tackle this? How do we do this in a way that doesn't set us up for failure because we, we wanna do something meaningful here? So the, the two in red here that are complete, you know, we want to verify our current offering of required courses and make sure that that is what, what we say we're offering is actually what we're offering and is it the appropriate coursework. And then identifying those pain points and improvement areas that then create our two deliverables that I'll talk about next that are in process. So the, the two big general areas that we're working on in this project is to answer two questions. One is we need to identify who needs training who in the university needs this training, and then make sure that they are aware of this training and that we can assign and track it. 
And then the second piece is as we worked through this, we thought, if we're gonna assign training to people and really push this accountability, we need to make sure that our training is value added, it's quality, and that it's answering the questions that need to be answered. So we're also auditing ourselves. So those are the two big deliverables we're working on um, in health safety and risk management. So the first one, the solution part one, this is the who. Who needs training? How do we figure out who needs training? And we had all sorts of ideas of, can we look at job codes and say, if you're in a research-related job code, we can just assign you training. Can we um, work with the college and units, have them tell us, and then we can try to load that. I mean, there was all these, you know, it took us some time to figure out what's doable and what's not. And again, across five campuses, multiple rocks and other centers, those options seemed really tricky. Um, we stumbled across the group in health sciences that's doing this already on a smaller scale for human research training, and they've developed a questionnaire that they use to help folks walk through what are their needs, what are their needs and able to do their work safely. And their focus is on a very niche, I mean, human research, research training is very niche compared to what we do. So we've been working with that group, and we think we have a possible solution, we're really excited about it, that we're here to talk about, is to be able to develop an assessment questionnaire and we're gonna pilot this with new employees and employees that are transferring from one unit to another. And the safety training needs questionnaire would help a supervisor and employee walk through what is it that you do? What are the hazards that you face? What training should be required? We can then develop a, a, a training um, roadmap for them to say, here are the things that you need to take. So we're working currently, again, with our in-house group over in the health sciences IT group um, to develop this questionnaire. So that's solution part one. That, that, that tackles the who needs training. And then the second part, which we said as a parallel path, is are we, are we training the right folks on the right frequency and the right modality to make sure we're compliant? So we wanted to audit ourselves. So we have issued an RFP, um, it went out this fall, to have someone come in and, and review our own safety training content. So with this project going, we, I mean, we wanted to come and talk about some of the implications more broadly for the university. You know, if we find success and traction, this could be something scalable that other units could take on. I mean, we're obviously, we don't have a, a hold on training. Other people do training, right? There's data security training, there's HIPAA training, there's training on, in, you know, on financial um, management, but this might be something, you know, a process that could be scalable for other areas. So we're gonna really focus on data collection, um, analysis, outputs to see if this is something that can help the broader university community. But at a minimum, we will meet the intent of the, of the internal audit finding and make sure we, we respond to those, those essential items. So in a project of this size, again, that's enterprise-wide, we can't do it alone. And, and that's, again, why some of the, the work in the beginning took so long is we had to understand what's in our control and what can we influence, what's outside of our span of control, and, and who do we need to bring into this conversation. And so we just wanna recognize that we will work closely with the Office of Human Resources, um, because some of these issues around, is a training required? What happens if an employee takes it or doesn't take it? What are those ramifications are sort of outside of our span of control um, in health safety and risk management. We'll work closely with the Office of Information Technology to provide broader support of the current platforms or, or the roadmap forward to make sure we're doing it in a safe manner that you know, protects data and that works to try to collaborate across systems and not create additional silos. And then most importantly, you know, we're looking for buy-in from our senior leaders. Um, if we're gonna roll out a plan, support for this is critical or else if people don't choose not to use this option, the results will not be <laughs> very positive. So we're really looking to get support from our senior leaders about the, the importance of getting folks signed up and using this tool. So just to summarize sort of the project is, you know, here's our timeline. It says we launched the project in spring of 23, but again, these have been discussions that have been going on for multiple years, again, of deciding what is the scope of this? What does it mean to do safety training? You know, how far are we going to launch? So we finally, as we defined that scope, we were able to launch the project in the spring. We're excited this summer that we actually understand now what solutions we can develop, what's doable. <laughs> we're working towards a spring um, pilot date, which we hope to come back with you know, some, some results or some information that says, is this a path forward that's sustainable and that works? Most of the work has been done in-house. We're using our own folks um, within the health, si health safety and risk management team, and they're doing a great job. We're using folks on the health sciences. 
So we feel like we're doing this in a very fiscally responsible way. Um, but it's a big undertaking to try to find ways to effectively train 27,000 <coughs> employees and students and anyone else that would like to take safety training. So that, in a nutshell, is our you know is the is the update. I am happy to take any questions that you might have. Yeah, thank you very much. I think you summarized it perfectly. This is a very significant undertaking. So I'm glad we're talking about it. And um, I will turn to Vice Chair Gully for questions or comments. Um, I just had one question, and actually, you gave a great presentation, and thank you so much. And this is a huge undertaking. Um, uh, just for me and um, for anyone else who might be new to just thinking about this um, particular question, I was wondering, um, you know, uh, and I want to be clear that I don't think $50,000 seems like an unreasonable amount for the scope of work, mm -hmm. um, but just wanted to ask, because most of the work is in-house, what does that $50,000 include and, and how do we, um, and also how do we pay for it? Right. Or maybe you don't know that, maybe that's on us, but I just wondered. <laughs> um, Chair Farns with Vice Chair Gulley, good question. We so that it's a, it's set up through an internal sales organization. Um, the the folks in the health sciences IT group, they work uh, based on people asking them to do services, and then we have to then pay for those services. Um, so they're not a they're not an O and M sort of funded shop. So we are paying them through an ISO, and our department is using savings. I mean, in all honesty, we're using carry forward savings that we had from the COVID years to to cover these expenses. So it's internal to internal? Correct. Okay, great, Correct. thank you so much. Sure. Any other questions? All right, uh, Regent Davenport. Thank you, Chair Farnsworth, and thank you, AVP Bonison. Um, I'm very supportive of this. I see this as a very, very high priority. Um, my question is, it seems, or just for clarification, there's no centralized training today but slips, falls, and those kind of things seems like we all took that training. And then um, the an expectation I would have within the centralized system, which I'm guessing it will include, is that uh, an employee comes on board, there's 90 days or whatever where they're um, tracked for all the training that they need and there's consequences if they do not participate in the training. Uh, Chair Farnsworth, Regent Davenport, great question. And to be clear, there, there is training that is assigned to all um, university community members, and that might be the PRISM training or data management. It's just there's not a centralized platform. There's not, we're not all playing in one platform with one, um, one string of data where I could say, you know, for Mary Davenport, she has taken 12 training courses over the last three years. We just don't have that one view. Um, and all training that is available on our website is available to all community members, so they could, they could opt in. But to your question of, you know, within 60 days or 90 days, I think those are some of the discussions we would like to have with our partners in OHR of what would be those personnel requirements. Then what's the, the, the hammer and the carrot kind of piece of, you know, if so, if you don't do it, then what? And in our role, we're, we're influencers in the sense that we don't have a ton of authority. We can't say, you didn't take your training, so you can't, you can't go in your lab. But we would like to work with our, the Office of Human Resources to figure out what's appropriate. You know, if you're going to set expectations, then you know, how do you try to, to, and the hope is people do it. And I think most people want to do the right thing. But if they don't, then what? So I don't have that answer, but we do hope to work with, um, with our partners to figure out what does that look like and what's, what's an appropriate response. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, please. Just one comment that I would say um, for myself, and I'm guessing for many or all my colleagues, this would be a high priority, and that's a message that can go out once this gets an action <laughs> mobilized. I appreciate that. <laughs> I have one quick question. Um, I was looking back, I think it's page 14, where you talk about the slide where it says solution part one, and it talks about the um, safety training needs assessment tool. Um, and so just wanted to understand maybe a little bit more how uh, you know, that seems like a good, you know, based on where we are now, that seems like a good solution to at least start reining some of this in. And I'm trying to get a little bit more of an understanding of how requirements, you know, would be integrated into um, the needs assessment 
questionnaire because it talks about how um, future employees could be auto enrolled in safety training based on the responses to the need assessment needs assessment questions. And so I'm assuming you know there's requirements or compliance or other things that would be on that end that matches that does the auto enrolling with the employees. Could you be could we provide a little bit more um, clarity just for my purposes on that? Sure, Chair Farnsworth. Uh, it's a good question, and I won't pretend that I know all the details, but it's basically the development of a logic model okay. around. So it will at, we'll start with the most broad-based questions and start funneling you down. And right now what we're developing is really focusing on training and not anything else. There, there are some discussions around could we do this and help identify people who might need to have you know, certain PPE or other, other requirements that might be associated but aren't training related. But it, it would start broad and say things like, do you work with animals? And if you work with it, the answer is yes, and it's going to send you down this chute where, you know, is it mammals, is it this, is it this, you know, are you working with an infectious disease like bird flu? So it'll continue to fine tune those needs, um, hopefully in a way that's meaningful. We're not going to catch everything. Um, like I said, we're developing this logic model and testing it. Um, there will be things that will fall through the cracks and hopefully we'll identify, but we're, our goal is to get 90% of those big high hazard areas. Does that, does that help? Did I answer your question? Yeah, that's helpful. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Right, yeah, I would just, I would agree with Regent Davenport that this is a very high priority. Uh, appreciate the work that's being done so far and looking forward to continued updates. Thank you so much. Appreciate the time. Thank you. Our next item is to act on the proposed amendments to the Office of Internal Audit Charter. No changes have been made since we reviewed the proposed amendments in September. And since this is an action item, I will, um, before I turn to Chief Auditor Galswick for any comments and then any final questions or discussions from the committee, uh, I will entertain a motion to recommend approval of the proposed amendments to the Office of Internal Charter. So move, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Is there? Second. All right. So it's been moved and seconded. I will turn to Chief Auditor Galswick for any final comments, then any um, discussion by the committee. Uh, perfect. Thank you, Chair Farnsworth. <clears throat> so as a quick reminder to the committee, as we discussed in September, the changes to the audit charter are primarily to reflect uh, the changes that were previously made to the Board of Regent Policy, Reservation, and Delegation of Authority. Uh, so the bulk of those changes were changes related to uh, my reporting line. Uh, specifically the administrative reporting line to the chair of the board, changing that from the reporting line to the president, um, as well as codifying the reporting requirement. As I mentioned in September, we always would have brought those types of uh, major concerns uh, to the committee and to the board, but as that was added into the policy, we thought we should codify that in our audit charter uh, as well. Again, as a reminder, the audit charter is the is our foundational document that we, we go back to in reference. Uh, when we're doing audit work to, to provide us the authority uh, and responsibilities in order to do our job. So with that, I stand for any questions the committee may have. All right, uh, Vice Chair Gully. Um, thank you, Regent Farnsworth. Thank you, um, um, <laughs> Auditor Galswick. Gals <laughs> Auditor Galswick. Gals <laughs> Auditor Galswick. <laughs> Here's my question. So I, I have been thinking a lot about what it means, um, how how folks like um, come to the board and how uh, we ensure that, that there's um, independence where needed. Um, I was not obviously part of the discussion in, in 2021 about changing this. Um, and so, and I have real reservations about the possibility of our independent auditor, who our auditor, our internal auditor, who's supposed to be very independent, serving on the um, cabinet. Mm -hmm. um, so my question is, I guess, uh, you know, how do you remain independent while also serving, like, also reporting to the president and also serving on the cabinet? Yeah, thank you, Chair Farnsworth, uh, Regent Kelly. So uh, we do all of our audit work under the uh, purview of what's the Institute of Internal Auditors, which does provide for um, the ability for us to provide advisory services and, and do consulting engagements as well as, as doing what we refer to as assurance work. Uh, one of the things, one of the ways I like to think about it, and I've mentioned this to you before, is we always say that the best findings are the ones we never have to write. 
So if we're able to talk through processes that are being implemented, various risks that may be associated with those, think about those controls on the front end, then we can be in a position where we never really have those, those issues on the back end. Where the independence, I think, really comes into play and where um, you know, we are required to, to you know, provide professional uh, independence and objectivity as part of our, our standards is that when we do our assurance engagements, we will always provide the information to the board um, in our reports as, as, is, as it is. We will always provide you the facts. Now, that being said, we can work with, we as we do within our audit reports, as you've seen, we will work with management to say, you know, could you provide a response before we make this, this report public, et cetera. Um, but we will always provide our, our um, separate object, objective opinion. I think the other piece is that where we are able to ensure objectivity, I think is important to highlight, is ultimately, um, I report directly to the committee. I report directly to the to the chair to the chair of the overall board at this point. Uh, so there wouldn't be a situation where undue influence or pressure could be put on me to um, you know to not provide my professional opinion on anything that we're looking at. Um, uh, Ray Shergley. Yeah. And I, I just want to say, in no way am I suggesting. Yeah. I, I know that you are incredibly professional, um, but I do have concerns about just you know, uh, not just you, but the future person, whoever takes the seat after you and after that, and these decisions can stay for a long time. Um, so I'd like to offer an amendment that we take out that part and I, you know, uh, so I'll stop there. <laughs> and then I can offer an explanation. Well, and just, uh, just to be clear, and I know- um... Oh, sorry, can I say that one more time? Oh yeah, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to offer. I'd like to offer an amendment that we take out the um, just the line that says that the chief auditor can serve on the president's cabinet. Okay. Um, just, okay it seems to be clear on that. Is there a second? Um, I would second it just because I want to ask a question about it um, and put it on the floor. Um, so um, I would second it. I know Regent Davenport. Did you want to comment on this? Item. Okay, Regent Davenport. Um, thank you. Because I was going to follow with the. So, my interpretation of this and why I'm not as bothered by it is that in looking at how um, a president puts together their cabinet and that presidents have different views on that, and where this says um, that the chief auditor is included by invitation, to me, I would interpret that that um, if there's a topic that's relevant or that's directly related to the auditor, I would want the auditor there. But the auditor has lots to do, lots on his or her plate, and that it wouldn't be necessary for them to be a regular cabinet member. So I don't know how that plays in with your question. Yeah, if you want to respond That's to right. that, Vice Actually, Chair Billy. can I ask a follow-up question? Sure. <laughs> uh, would this give you the possibility of serving as a permanent member of the cabinet all the time, or would it be by invitation to a specific meeting? And are you precluded from giving advisory opinions now? Uh, Chief Editor Galswick, I'd ask you to respond to that, and maybe just I was going to ask the question of could you talk a little bit more on the mechanics of what this means, what it means to serve on the cabinet, and then in the reading of this policy as it relates to that in particular. Sure. Thank you, Chair Farns with Regent Gully. Uh, so a couple of things here to break down. Um, so the to serve on the president's cabinet by invitation really means uh, whatever president may want me to be at any meeting um, currently i i attend the cabinet meetings as they are scheduled um, so generally i am at all of them uh, that wouldn't have to be the case and and they could always have separate meetings without me and you know to your point regent davenport there may be situations where i'm unable to attend for one reason or another 
Uh, I think that the importance of the chief auditor serving on the cabinet, and to be clear, this is something that has been done for decades. Um, and I think that it is completely appropriate and completely in alignment with Institute of Internal Audit Standards, uh, that it will it really provide some perspective to the audit department on what are the major risks, what are the major things that are happening at the institution, uh, which informs what we're going to audit, select to audit, to think about the ways in which that we can be help, helpful for the, the institution and to provide the highest quality of information to the board. Without that access, I mean, Without that access, we would essentially be auditing in the dark. We could select things that we think are important. We could maybe try to figure out what, what is happening in the institution. But I think the overall quality of, of what we we're able to do as an auditorium would be harmed uh, if we weren't able to have that sort of advisory type relationship uh, with, with the president uh, and senior leadership. Uh, so to the question of how this actually works in practice, uh, again, uh, normally, it is just an advisory type role where, where you know, I, I will be privileged to the information, the discussions that are happening at the cabinet level, provide opi provide opinions uh, where appropriate on risk management, et cetera. For specific audit activity that may be performed, uh, those are requested uh, of of the of the audit department. And as an example of that, that I would give is. Uh, what was it now, a year and a half ago, two years ago, when we did the review of the students' self-attestations on their vaccines, uh, whether that they were actually obtaining their vaccines, that was a request by President Gable that we take a sample, that we provide some independent um, review of those processes and um, be able to, to provide to both, to both the senior administration as well as the committee uh, the results of that to be able to say, Okay. Yes, we, we we do feel comfortable with this. So that was a place where that wasn't on our audit plan. That wasn't something asked for us to do by the audit committee. That was something that the president asked us to do, and I thought was completely appropriate uh, given our skill sets and given the the need for the institution. Um, so that would be my comments. Um, Let's see if there's any follow up by Regent uh, Gully, and then I have some people over here, and then I'll double check with Regent Davenport too. But. Oh, thank you. I'm thank you, Chair, um, and thank you, Auditor. I I'm wondering. Um, so I had two questions that I didn't think were quite addressed in there. Um, I, I, and actually, let me say, um, I know that this wasn't always the case, and was it a problem before, um, before the auditor was sitting on, like, sitting in these meetings? And is there anything that stops, that precludes you from, from being part of the meetings if you're not on the cabinet? Could the president just invite you to be you know, to like be part of it and to listen and whatever anyway. And um, sorry, I think that's, I can't remember if there was another part, but. I'll have um, Chief Hunter calls we could address those and then we'll um, get to some others that are in queue. Sure, uh, thank you, Chair Farnsworth, Regent Gully. Uh, so when this amendment was made in October of 2021, it was really just to codify that the uh, Chief Auditor could continue to sit on the President's Cabinet. Uh, in practice, the Chief Auditor had sat on the President's Cabinet um, since its inception under President Kaler, uh, or with using that terminology. Mm -hmm. Prior to there being a Cabinet, there were other arrangements, other groups, senior leader type, type activities in which the Chief Auditor would have sat on. So when the reporting line was changed in October of 21, uh, to the chair of the board, the committee or at the time wanted to clarify, I should say that the board wanted to clarify at the time that this would not preclude the, the chief auditor from continuing to work with the president to continue to, to, to have those advisory discussions and be informed on what is happening within the institution. And they thought that the president's cabinet was the highest level to, to really um, call out as a, as a way to um, say that, that that would continue to happen. I, the question of whether I could just go to the cabinet or be a member of it, I think is probably just a definitional question. I mean, in practice, the cabinet really is just an area for discussion. Um, so me being there listening, discussing would be no different than if I was, if I was, uh, um, you know, not considered part of the cabinet, but just an additional um, requested attendee. I think in practice, I think it would be the same thing. All right, I'm going to go to Regent Kenyanya, Provost Croson, and then Regent Davenport. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Regent Gully, for you know bringing this up. I think it's a good discussion. Um, you know, I've had the benefit of being in committee leadership, and the chief auditor will attest that uh, we've had a lot of independence discussions and whatnot. <laughs> um, you know, I think I pushed on that a bit. Lord knows, uh, um, Regent Rocha certainly did. You know, in, in a lot of our discussions. Uh, so, um, I was trying to pull up. I'm looking at uh, the reservation and delegation policy, and I can't quite. I'm hoping Mr. Steves will help me. I don't know if you remember the exact changes um, that were made that, that that are now leading to this. And I'm referring to that to say that um, Regent Gully, I think the the kind the. Um, the kind of guardrails you're describing to you know to make sure that independence is there regardless of who's in the seat were kind of addressed there and i think i mean the 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 performance review change that was the big one for me personally you know um and i i'm hoping mr chair i can phone one of these two friends maybe that one uh, to talk about this a little bit thank you director steve sure uh, Mr. Chair and members of the committee, um, this this topic has been one that has percolated and um, and been a discussion topic among regents for a number of years, um, and uh, it dates back to uh, there was a period of time, for instance, when the chief auditor was um, the annual performance review, the annual compensation adjustments, um, and the reporting line was solely to the president. Uh, it had kind of evolved to that. And the, the audit committee and regents were not involved in any way. Um, the first change we made was getting the audit chair involved in that review process and um, ensuring that the president and the audit chair were, were together reviewing the president or reviewing the, the chief auditor. Um, that was not a policy change, it was just a practice change that, that was implemented. But then when we had the retirement of a longstanding uh, chief auditor uh, and the search for a new auditor, it gave the board an opportunity to say, step back and say, you know, are there some changes that we should make that would be best practice changes that could um, ensure that we're that we're you know aligned with with what we think is is best practice in this space, and that's when policy changes were made to formally change the reporting line to ensure that there's direct call out to say that the chief auditor reports to the board of regents, um, and you know to the the chair of the board specifically in terms of kind of employment matters, and that the chair of the board will. Um, lead the annual performance review process and compensation adjustment process. And so that in a, in a major way shifted uh, the kind of the dynamic and the reporting line to ensure that the chief auditor knows exactly where, um, you know, who, who that person, you know, who they report to. Um, as part of that conversation, there were additional discussions around some of these other kinds of activities um, that are listed elsewhere in the docket as well, the, the cabinet and some of these other activities. And I think there were varying degrees of comfort with it overall. I think um, you know, some regions were not, would believe maybe there shouldn't be any of those kinds of activities. Other regions were much more comfortable with it. I think ultimately the board landed at um, believing that there was some value in continuing to have um, the chief auditor participate in those, in those activities. But I do think I, I, you know, there is some maybe some language adjustment here. I, you know, instead of serving on, maybe it's attending by invitation, or you know, I mean, there there could be some ways to 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 nuance the language a bit. But um, but I think that at least in 2021, where the board landed was that they they felt like with the adjustment in the reporting line and, and performance reviews, um, and that formally codifying that in policy, that there was still some value in some of these other activities. Abhijit Kanyanya. Yeah, what he said. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Mr. Steves. Um, yeah, that, I mean, that's the context I was trying to draw out in that, you know, for me, I do think these conversations are important. We've certainly had them. The board has had them. Um, you know, I think that change was really important in the uh, reservation delegation of authority. You know, there's a line in here that says the, you know, the president may remove other individuals 
accept the chief honor. I mean, explicitly called out, you know, that is one position the president cannot remove. Right. We changed the um, we changed the performance process around that. So I, I think being in there and, and being part of those discussions, and to your point, um, you know, the best, uh, what was the line? The best ones are the ones we don't, ones never have to write. Never have to write. Um, <laughs> I think under that spirit, it, it totally makes sense um, to participate there. Also, I mean, it's my understanding the cabinet, it's not a, a governance body. I mean, you're not voting and what, you know, it's discussion based and whatnot. So, I mean, if, if, if we want to tweak that language and whatnot, I mean, I think there could be benefit there, but in terms of serving there, um, I think that should continue. Um, and I, I don't know, I, I hope that context was helpful, but I'd be interested in hearing. Yeah. Yeah, well, Vice Chair Gully. If it's, if it's all right, Chair, um, and thank you. I would offer a, maybe a friendly amendment to my amendment that um, I that the Chief Auditor be allowed to participate um, rather than using the language of be a member of the cabinet. And I understand that it's semantics, but. So I'll turn to Executive Director Steeds, who has the benefit of subbing in today as our staff liaison with all this activity. <laughs> but um, my proposal, and I have the docket in front of me, and I'll verify this with Executive Director Steeds, that it would uh, change the end part to including the Chief Auditor participating, so switch serving to participating on the President's Cabinet by invitation. Is that what you're getting at, Vice Chair Gully? All right, and is she allowed to change that amendment? Okay, so that would then be the amendment on the table. I will turn to Provost Crowley. I will Croson. second that. Oh, amendment. is it? Thank you. Do you have to have a second for it? Oh, I mean. Well, that's, you have one now. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. I have one now. Obviously, the second, and the two of you had agreed, but that's fine. Great, that's great. great. We have one now. We're on the third. <laughs> Excellent. Provost Croson. Thank you, Chair Barnes, members of the committee. Um, I can't speak for the president, but as a member of the uh, cabinet, I would just want to attest that having Chief Auditor Galwick there is uh, really important. He is a valued participant. He contributes significantly to help us avoid risks that might otherwise, uh, we would assume. Um, I think having him actively there and participating makes our university safer. And so I would hate to be in a world where the Chief Auditor was, would not participate in the cabinet, maybe because the President declined to invite them. And I'm a little worried that this um, amendment opens the door to that. Thank you, Provost Cross, and I will go to Regent Davenport. Well, I have to. If you're still, <laughs> yeah. If you, <laughs> if you wanna. I was going to say, and I was involved in the yeah. search, um, and it was very rigorous and very competitive, and. Um, but we could get a wayward auditor, I suppose, someday. But, <laughs> but we don't. Um, and that I think it's it's the big fix to me is reporting to the board in the performance review by the board. I think that's a very important fix. And um, I, w I would echo what Provost Croson said, anecdotally from myself, having served on a cabinet. Boy, we'd have gone some misdirection mm -hmm. without an auditor present. <laughs> but but that is a concern of mine that you just raised, that we could get a wayward president. <laughs> no, we would have a president who'd prefer an auditor not on there, and I think that would be a big miss. So um, it is important semantics in the sense of serving, attending, um, by invitation, I'm not sure where to go with that one, so I'll wait for other. <laughs> uh, Regent Kenyanya. Thank you. Uh, now I don't have it in front of me. The, the invitation part was there anyway, mm -hmm. so I don't think we changed anything, because even it said serve by invitation. The only, my understanding is that the only word that has changed is instead of serving, it would be participate. So I'm saying to say, I, I actually, I mean, the provost brought up a great point, as Regent Davenport pointed out, and I am thinking about that now, but I don't know that that change changes that, because it's the invitation part that gets to that point, and that was there before and after the amendment. Right. Regent Davenport? And it does come back to the board. This is our report, and the president is our report, so we have a hand on it. 
Um, Vice Chair Gully, since it was your amendment, I will end with you. And we I had some flexibility in the agenda, but we're running out. So but go ahead, Vice Chair I, I Gully. I just want to echo uh, what Regent, and thank you, Chair. Um, I did want to echo what Regent Kanyanya said, that, um, that I absolutely appreciate the comments of the provost, and these two things are not, they're not the same. There's no removing or adding the language of invitation that's always been there and would continue in this. So the only language change is in the amendment um, is the serve versus participate. Great. I would like to move us forward on a vote on the amendment, or actually Chief Hunter Callsbeck. Apologies. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Chair Farnsworth. Uh, so related to the specific amendment, I don't know if I have, I don't think I have any concerns with switching it to participating from serving because I think ultimately it is very similar. Um, I think to Provost Croson's point, I think it would be a disservice to the institution uh, if the chief auditor was not on the cabinet. Um, whether that is by invitation by the president requesting the, the auditor to be there or whether it was mandated, there might be a discussion on, on what the board would want to do related to that. But I think in practice, if the board mandated it, that you can't really force someone to be open and discuss with, with the auditor. To be blunt, the chief auditor, whomever that is, has to earn that um, to, to demonstrate that they're a valued member of, of the, the committee, that they're fair and independent, et cetera. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't, I would, the only comment I would have is if you switch it here, that language, the serve piece, I believe is coming straight out of the policy. And so, but that policy is up for review. Um, and I think that uh, it's a small enough change that we could say that we're just clarifying it in the audit charter here in order to be able to, to move that forward and, and to be able to complete it. And then you can look at changing that wording when, when you update the policy. I did violate my own rule that the maker of the um, amendment or motion gets the last word. So oh. Vice Chair Gully, did you want to say anything else? <laughs> Thank you for the robust debate, everyone. Appreciate it. <laughs> All right. Um, I would like to move us to a vote on the amendment before we move to a vote on the overall amendments to the Office of Internal Charter, um, Internal Audit Charter. So I think everyone's clear on this amendment. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? All right, that amendment passes. And then I would move us to any final comments or discussion on the overall package of amendments to the Office of Internal Audit Charter. Um, there be no further discussion. It appears we are ready to vote. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, say no. The uh, motion is approved. Thank you, everyone, for the robust conversation, and I'm glad we had some flexibility built into our agenda today. <laughs> um, next, our fourth item is the internal audit update. I would then turn it back over to Chief Auditor Galsworth. Thank you, Chair Farnsworth. So the internal audit update begins on page 25 of your materials, but I'm going to jump ahead today straight to page 47, um, which is our audit activity report. The audit activity report provides an overview of the audit activity that we've performed uh, since our last update in June. Since then, we've completed seven audits. Four of those are what we refer to as more standard audits, and three are transition reviews. Of the four standard audits, uh, we three of them are rated as good. That includes Athletics Ticketing Office here in the Twin Cities, which I think is especially notable uh, given you think about the scope and scale of what they do. A million fans a year are ticketed. 200 events, $38 million in revenue that, that they're bringing through. And they've made some significant staffing and technology uh, improvements over, over the last uh, few years. So, so we are happy about those results. The e-consent e audit was looking at human participants uh, in research and their ability to consent to be a part of that research electronically. Uh, this was originally implemented during the pandemic. Uh, so there was a level of um, expedited implementation that occurred. Uh, so we're glad to, to overall find that that the operations and controls they've implemented are good. There are a few essential items in, in that audit, but it's really related to the high level of inherent risk associated with it. So making sure you're using the right form, making sure you're getting the right documentation carries an uh, extra level of weight in, in those uh, spaces. Then finally, the, the last good report was aerospace and engineering. Uh, this is a department within the College of Science and Engineering. Big thing to note there is they do a tremendous amount of research. Uh, $9.8 million of their $14 million of revenue are coming in from, from research. They're also one of the units that is working in the highly restricted data space or the uh, controlled and classified information, also referred to as CUI. 
Uh, there was one report in our audit on page 50, uh, Boynton Health, that uh, we rated as needs improvement. <clears throat> you can see that on the bar chart that there's a lot of red there. This reflects in, in large part the high level of inherent risk associated with Boynton Health's activities. Uh, Boynton Health does a lot around, around this institution and sometimes people uh, lose track of that. They have clinics in dentistry, doing dental clinics, eye clinics, mental health. They provide the gopher chauffeur program, a, a nutrition program. They also run the student health benefit plan. So given their highly regulated and highly sensitive work, uh, when we have issues related to information technology and compliance, that's going to result in a higher level of um, of red and reflect that in, in our report. A lot of these issues involve compliance, information technology, but also some concerns related to just the oversight and governance of those functions. I think it's important to note that there has been a, a leadership transition uh, in Boynton Health uh, to Colleen McDonald, who was the former head of our Kook Clinic, mm -hmm. the university's Kook Clinic. And so she's recently moved over in 2022. Um, and I think she is intending on addressing a lot of these issues by trying to leverage some additional central solutions. Uh, Boynton Health traditionally was a lot more independent of a, of a unit especially going back uh, many years um, and that they've been gradually moving in the direction of using more essential services and I think she plans to continue that partnering with folks over in OIT health and uh, the HIPAA compliance office for the transition reviews we had three transition reviews that we uh, completed the Carlson School of Management and President Gables, both, uh, we had no um, issues, which I think is especially notable for the president, where there was additional separation agreement uh, information that we looked into to make sure she was complying with all of that. Um, and we had no, no issues that were identified with that. The third, the third transition report, uh, GPSA, or Global Programs and Strategy Alliance, uh, we had a couple of issues related to international travel um, that the departing uh, AVP had uh, related to registering your travel and expenses. Um, these are relatively minor. The other thing to note as part of that report, we didn't call it out as an issue because it's all policies uh, were, were followed, so that there was no particular issue. But a, a broader concern that we identified was there was some changes to some of her direct reports salaries. Some of these changes are relatively significant. Uh, and those are made by her despite uh, her imminent departure and without some sort of one-up approval. Uh, Provost Croson has, has implemented an expectation going forward that her AVPs, if they are making significant pay raises, that that would go, go to her for an additional one-up approval. And Vice President Horstman and the, and the senior leadership team is in consultation about establishing a broader policy to maybe establish some thresholds that over a certain threshold that requires one of approval go, going forward. <clears throat> Page 55, there is the uh, peak update. Just there was no additions to that, but as a reminder to the committee, we maintain that schedule uh, so that uh, the committee and the uh, administration and the internal audit department, frankly, are able to keep track of places where management action plans have pointed to peak for part of their remediation strategy for how they plan to resolve issues that were identified. All right, so going all the way back to page 26 to go back to our internal audit update, from a staffing perspective, uh, we were able to hire two new financial auditors in the last couple of months. Uh, we did lose one though over the summer, so we're still down one. Uh, there's a lot of work that goes into hiring and onboarding, uh, as you can imagine, especially having a number of new hires over the over the last few years. With the, with that, that's impacting um, our our current progress on our audit plan. We think we're probably slightly behind schedule from what we were originally intending, uh, where we were originally intending on being at this point. It's always hard in October to know. It's pretty early in the schedule. So I'm not overly concerned at this point. I think that we will still be able to complete our audit plan, but I just at least wanted to put that on the, on the radar of the committee at this point. I will let you know in February if there are any uh, major issues or if there's audits that we have to defer. To going to uh, page 27, the follow-up results. So this is normally where, where I start. Uh, my remarks, but we were hoping for some time for a little bit broader discussion today, so I wanted to to end on the, on the follow-up uh, uh, results today. We had an implementation rate of essential recommendations of 
that's shown in the bottom left corner of, of your document. This is slightly below our expected rate of 40%, but it has increased over the last two periods of 35% and 18%. Of the items that are open, 55% of those are considered past due based upon when management originally believed that they would be able to address those issues. For the items that are outstanding, this includes 10 essential items that are past the two year mark. I won't go through those in, in great detail, um, just given, given the time that we have here. Uh, but I would note that dentistry makes up five of those and they have made considerable progress on their 27 initial open uh, essential items to get it down to five. They've had a lot of staffing constraints. They're trying to implement some new technologies and, and processes. Uh, so I think that that is um, reasonable and, and hoping that they will be able to complete those by the next period. Uh, UMD Fine Arts uh, continues to make progress on their Tweed Museum inventory issue. Uh, where they've, they have now uh, established a plan with working with a consultant and plan to bring in uh, some student employees as well as some contract employees in order to complete their inventory and appraisal of the inventory. Uh, I will leave, leave you to look at the other ones and if you have any questions, you can let me know. The collaborative assessment is on page 32. Uh, just as a reminder to the committee, uh, the administration will be back in May to talk about the results uh, or results of their work to uh, remediate the high risk items that were identified in that assessment. And then internal audit intends to then in FY25 to go and do some audit work to confirm that those controls are in place uh, as stated to the committee. So with that, I want to end my discussion end my discussion with a, with a, or end my comments of the, to open it up for discussion on the follow-up tracking processes. So this has been something that has come up in discussion with audit leadership in the past and at, audit, and at the audit committee, that when we have a goal rate of 40% and you know we miss that goal, what should the committee do with that? Or, or how should we really think about this 40% number? So a little bit of background on this on this 40% number. This is the implementation rate goal that we have used for over 30 years. Uh, we established this rate, or internal audit established this rate, um, originally with the idea that it would be the rate you would need in order to get through most, if not all, of the issues within a single fiscal year. When you're adding additional items, and given that we're doing three updates within it over the course of the year. However, as, as you can see at the bottom of page 27, in, in our visualization there, we're only, the administration is only hitting those uh, results about a third of the time. Uh, we're actually getting to 40%, sometimes very close, some periods such as February where, where it's missed a little bit larger. So I think there's several reasons that I've discussed with the committee in the past for why the implementation rate is not being consistently hit. I think one of the big ones is that the nature of the audits that we do and the findings that we have have changed over the years, uh, where we used to do a lot more unit audits where we'd go in, look for compliance on very specific uh, controls and processes. We still do some of that work, but it's becoming a smaller and smaller component of our overall um, uh, audit plan. So when we had issues of that nature that were a little bit more direct and smaller, I think it was easier for uh, a unit to start following the, using the right form, follow the right policy and be able to correct those uh, quicker. Um, but now when we're looking more in process audits, broader issues, when we think about you know, our comments earlier today by Associate Vice President uh, Catherine Bonison, for example, this is a large project. This is a, this will take many years in order to be able to implement that. And though that might be on the extreme end of things that take a lot of time, there's a lot more out there that may require a new system, re-architecting a process, that this is a six month to a year process from the get-go. So you start getting a, you start getting a number of those, those um, piled up, you can see how it, it, it makes it harder to hit that implementation rate. Add to that, you end up with some units that have a large number of essential items, such as you know the dentistry example, where they they have limited staff and they're going to have to think through how they prioritize and and manage through that that project plan in order to be able to to, to address those. So, after discussion with leadership and uh, an extensive discussion with the internal audit team, we thought through what would be some other statistics uh, or things that we could think about trying to do uh, to provide a little bit more perspective to the committee. And one of the ideas that we had was, well, we could say, let's just move it to 35%. It seems like that's closer to where we are. Or if you look at our three-year average, we hit 34%. 
But the problem is that that, from my perspective, is a little bit you're moving the goalposts. And so if we move it to 35%, then, you know, if we're suddenly realizing we're getting closer to 32, do we move it back to 30? Yeah, you know, I don't know if that's really going to achieve the ends we want. The other item, the other possibility is we could put more focus on just the past due items. That's something that's been suggested in the past by some folks in the administration, where they say, well, if we knew this was going to take a year and a half, you know, why are we why are we being held to, to a broader implementation rate? What I don't like about about that strategy is I think it encourages then the administration to provide longer timelines to give themselves a little bit of buffer. Um, I think also if we put a lot of focus on just the, the timeline, it becomes uh, more pressure to implement something to get it done that that might not be as sustainable, might not be um, uh, you know, something that that that, the, that will really last, but more something just to get the, the finding to be closed. You know, a very manual process, for example. Uh, so I, I, I worry about trying to put too much focus on it. I think it's a good statistic. I think it's an important statistic. And as you can see, you know, we've, we've been providing that and we're providing that average in this current report. And I would think that that would make sense to provide it going forward, but I don't know if I want to set a hard number on that or start to put pressure on it. So my proposal is, a uh, couple of things. One, I think going forward, providing that chart at the bottom that, that has the three-year numbers and the averages, I think is important for the committee because what I think we should be thinking about is trends. If we have a single period that is, is really bad, you know, what are the reasons for that? Maybe we had a couple of big audits that came out, um, you know, that, that was reasonable. Maybe there's some, some bigger issues going on. Maybe, you know, we saw this, it doesn't show up in our numbers, but in the pandemic, at the early part of the pandemic, it may, makes it a little bit harder, right, in order to to be able to achieve um, implement uh, to achieve the implementation rate. In addition to that, I will continue to provide to the committee my assessment of those rates and where we're at to help both identify the trends, but also to call out if I think there are places in which units are struggling to make progress. We have had that in the past, where you know they don't have the resources, they're in a situation where they need additional support. Um, you know, that might be something that I can raise to the committee and say, hey, this is a unit that is, that's trying, but they're struggling because of X, Y, Z. Uh, the other piece is to, to be able to uh, tell the committee, and thankfully this hasn't happened in, in several years, but if there was a, a unit that was just being obstinate and refusing to implement things, I would absolutely bring that to the committee and we would have those folks come in and talk to the audit committee about, about why we're not making additional progress. So that's our thinking on this, and, the, and that's the background. One other thing, I almost forgot I even printed items if in case people wanted to see it. Uh, one other item that we added uh, when I took over the chief auditor role, um, and so we started providing this in June of 22, is in the annual, so annually, we're providing a, an assessment of, yeah, could you pull it up, Skeeter? Thank you. So this was in the June docket materials. And so what we're trying to demonstrate with, with this document is for each fiscal year, how many were getting completed within one fiscal year? How many did it take over a year? How many did it hit the two year mark? And as, if, as you will recall, when the 40% number was originally implemented, part of the goal was to get most through most of them within a single uh, fiscal year. So this helps it to give a visual depiction of what are the trends related to that. Uh, obviously, it won't provide as much information on the current fiscal year, so it's fiscal year 23, because some of those items in, in this particular bar maybe were only a few months old at that point. But you can see the trend over time of are we seeing an increased number that are taking longer than a year or, or smaller. So for example, in the FY20, I would point to the pandemic as a big cause for why we suddenly had um, you know, 23 that took over a year and eight that took uh, two, uh, that really hit the two fiscal year mark, um, simply because there was just a lot of other work that was happening and, you know, disruptions to staffing, et cetera. So with that, uh, open up to any questions that the committee may have on follow-up tracking or processes. Thank you, Chief Auditor Goswick. Any questions? Uh, Regent Davenport. Maybe not, thank you, Chair Farnsworth, maybe not, as much a question as a perspective, my, my personal perspective on this, is that the board has expectations that, the, that compliance will be achieved. Not in 10 years, not always in one year, 
but within something that's timely depending on the level of difficulty and when do you see actual change. So I would not be in favor of moving the goalpost. Um, but I appreciate that when we get these reports and they're a quick review of red, yellow, green. And for example, this is the fifth year I've seen dentistry on there and I know it's complex. And, I, and the explanation I've gotten over the years on why that's taking so long satisfies me. So I think what we have is a, is a good system, but I, I think um, as a regent, my message is about expectation that these are taken seriously and I wanna see them move to green. So um, I, I don't see any um, necessity for change um, and I guess would follow your recommendation in, in that regard. Well said, student representative. Yeah, thank you, Chair Farnsworth. Uh, Chief Father Calls, thank you for your presentation. I was wondering if you could provide some insight into how the different metrics were chosen for the internal audit updates on pages 35 to 46 of the docket. Um, I appreciated seeing the original report evaluation and then the subsequent audit period evaluations, but I was wondering if you could just share how the individual metrics are chosen for the individual buckets or areas being audited. One second. Ah, uh, th thank you, Chair Farnsworth, uh, student representative, student representative um, Vasilopoulos. <laughs> Vasilopoulos. Uh, so our bar charts are always um, our s summary independent opinion on where we think that the risk level is. So when we think about our bar charts, we think about them in terms of residual risk. Right, so again, you have units that may have very high levels of inherent risk, but they have very good controls. You have you know, a generally good bar chart, or you may have a unit or a process that is not as high of risk and they have pretty good controls and you don't have as big of, um, or you don't have as, as bad of a bar chart, you have a better bar chart. So we establish those bar charts on, on most of our reports. Uh, we don't on the transition reviews and some other very targeted ones, but generally you will see these bar charts on all of our audit reports. The first four bars at the top of it are consistent. Uh, those are coming out of the, the COSO framework. Uh, and then the bars below that are the control activities mm -hmm. that are unique to whatever unit that, that we're currently auditing. So the initial color is our assessment of where, where we believe it was at the time of audit. As we then follow up on, on the essential items, our highest risk items in our audit report, those uh, connect or correlate to the red within the bar charts. So as they implement their, their controls, we will gather that evidence and we will pull the red out of the bar chart in order to show it moving towards green. So eventually you get to a point at the end of, at the end of this progress and implement, implementation, you get to the ones where they've implemented all of the essential items and those are fully green. We don't remove the yellow as just a point of note um, because we don't do follow up on those significant items so they stay there. It doesn't mean that they are not now resolved. It just means that we haven't gone back and independently confirmed them. That's helpful, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Regent Canada, did you have a question? Did. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Chief Auditor, th thanks for bringing the discussion, right? Because I'm, you know, it has been a while where there's that caveat, you know, mm -hmm. that you offer to the end. So I, I do appreciate um, setting the stage, you know, to have the discussion. I, I agree with Regent Davenport um, in terms of the goalposts, um, you know, and making sure those metrics stay the same. Um, I, I guess. Uh, for the, I, I mean, some, some, I don't know, hybrid model or, or whatnot may be appropriate because I think something you pointed out that resonates with me, um, it's, is the ones that are past due the expected time, right? And in, in the, in the chart we looked at, I mean, you know, we certainly know an audit that, you know, just requires some changes on a website versus a whole process. I mean, those are going to take different times. And I, I think that's just what, for myself, would be helpful to measure against. Here's the how complex it is. Here's how. And it's my understanding that the units determine the, you know, they tell you this is how long this is probably going to take. 
Um, you did point out the risk of folks inflating that time, you know, if they know that's a metric. And I, I mean, that's there. And, um, but if, if we can just measure against what this item should take rather than next reporting period, um, and I don't know what that perfectly looks like, but I mean, it, it may, you know, maybe we don't, maybe we don't necessarily resolve it today, mm -hmm. but I do appreciate you bringing up that discussion because that, you know, that has been the trend and I'm glad that, you know, you're aware of it and, and thinking about it. Do you want to respond, Chief Auditor? Yeah, that's Chair Farnsworth, Regent Kenyania. I, I agree. I, I think the past due is an important item for us to be keeping track of because management is saying this is when we believed um, you know they were going to be able to, to address these. Obviously, no plan survives first contact, but you know this is they are establishing these, yeah. and I think it's a good way of thinking about it. If they knew it was something that was going to take eighteen months. It's not past due in three months, and so to think about that number, and I think that's and that's why, um, as an addition here, we're providing. We haven't provided that that before the three year numbers related to the past due as well, and, and the averages associated with that. Because though we don't necessarily have a goal that says you know only forty percent should be past due or pick it, pick whatever number you want, we can again still look at the trends of it. Do we have a, a situation here where suddenly? Um, more and more of these items are coming past you and what might be the underlying root cause. The other piece I would highlight is that on specific individual audits, I will try to provide a little bit of context and feedback uh, when there's one that has a lot that are past due. To let, even if it's, it hasn't hit the two year mark, um, I, I will try to give you some information like I have with dentistry uh, in the past where, hey, they're having additional staffing issues. They're, this is why they have so many that are past due. Regent Kenyanya. Thank you. Briefly, uh, that's helpful. And I, and I guess I, in just thinking about it, I would comment, I mean, um, just maybe I would give some credit to management, you know, in that they will give us accurate um, time. And, you know, I mean, there's, there's, I don't know, a smell test, you know, it's like, okay, this is going to take 10 years, really, you know, and I don't think we're going to see much abuse in that. Will there be a little inflate, some padding? Sure, and I think that I do it with my work. I'll, you know, I, you know, I give myself an extra day, you know, with my supervisors, and I think that's okay. Um, so <laughs> we'll have to send them this tape now. Yeah. <laughs> I got a lot of work done last night, and I'm going to send it out slowly throughout the day. Perfect. It's really productive today. <laughs> I know we are tight on time, and we should wrap up in the next five minutes or so. But any um, further discussion or questions? I'll just add two things on this item before we transition to the last item. I want to th uh, on the transition review reports, particularly on the associate VP and Dean of Global Programs and Strategy Alliance. I want to thank the provost for um, putting, you know, inserting that check in the meantime um, of the one-up reviews of significant salary increases. I think that's really important. And then I would just strongly, strongly support um, the work that OHR is doing to um, look at establishing a university-wide policy for one-up reviews of any salary changes made by departing senior leaders. Um, this situation was concerning to me, and so I'm glad that we're taking um, action on that front and, and really support that. Uh, the second thing is going to be for Chief Auditor Galswick and for a further conversation looking at the management and remediation plans that involve PEAK on page 55. Um, it would be helpful for me, and I don't know if other colleagues feel this way, but to understand um, where those issues are as it relates to the phases of PEAK. So um, for me, you know, I see the issue with um, processing I-9s uh, within the UMD Human Resources Department. Um, that's, you know, an employee quality of life issue. I see that report was released in August 2021. Um, I want to know, you know, at what phase of peak is that getting fixed? Um, and the same with the rest of these, these issues as well. So maybe that's something that could just be added to this chart in in the future um, i see the recommend like the status of essential recommendation but again what phase of peak implementation does it tie to um, we don't have to go through each one now but we can talk about that um, so that's that's all i have in this item uh, i will then uh, th or thank thank chief auditor galswick for the update thank committee members for the discussion and then move to any um, comments from chief auditor galswick on our information items I uh, think Chair Farnsworth is uh, short on time. I'll just say that there's one information item. It involves uh, uh, audit work performed 
um, by a firm for the KUMD for the Corporation of Public Broadcasting. KUMD has since, since been uh, um, sold and is no longer part of, part of the institution, but this was some remaining work that, that involved that and is part of the Audit Compliance, Audit and Compliance Committee's oversight of the audit of the audit function, all external audit audit activity needs to be reviewed by the committee. So that's why it's being provided as an information. Any discussion or questions on the information item? All right, thank you um, to our presenters. Thank you to Chief Auditor Galswick and Provost Croson and committee members. There being no additional business before the committee, we stand adjourned.